So you recall that a Euclidean domain is an integral domain which has a Euclidean function, a Euclidean norm, which that Euclidean norm allows you to have some type of division algorithm that given any two elements, uh, there exists a unique quotient and remainder between those elements so that that remainder has some type of minimality condition attached to it. Integral domains are very important types of, excuse me, Euclidean domains are very important types of integral domains. We also talked about before that if you take the polynomial ring over a field or a skew field, that itself doesn't make it a field or a skew field. But what you do get is if you have a polynomial ring over a coefficient field, you do get a Euclidean domain. And that's what I want to prove in this video. Uh, that is, for polynomial rings with the right situation, you actually do get the division algorithm becomes Euclidean domain. Let's be explicit about this. Um, suppose we have some field F. Then, if we have two polynomials, F and G, uh, inside of the polynomial ring F adjoint X, and assuming that G is a non-zero polynomial, then in fact there exists unique polynomials Q and R such that F of X equals Q of X times G of X plus R of X, where R of X is either the zero polynomial or its degree is strictly smaller than G. Now let me remind you that uh, for the, because F is a field, it's in fact an integral domain. Every field is a domain of inter integral domain. And therefore, as we saw previously, f of x is gonna be a domain as well. And so on this domain, you have the degree function, which is in fact gonna be an additive norm on this function. And so with that stated, we can actually tell you that this norm is going to be a Euclidean norm, all right? Um, so that there's these unique polynomials q and r, so that r is either zero, or it has smaller norm than G because the norm is uh, the degree function. In particular, if F is a field, then F adjoint X is going to be a Euclidean domain. That's the main result we want here. And this is gonna have a big, big effect on factorizations of polynomials, okay? So first of all, let's suppose that F was a constant polynomial. So it's just a number that belongs to uh, it, it just belongs to the field, the coefficient field there. And so then you could write f of x as 0 times g of x plus r. r is a constant polynomial. And so, I mean, if, if f and g are both constants, then they're both unit. That's, they're both units. And so then divisibility is sort of a trivial statement there. So assuming that f is a constant polynomial and g is not, then its degree would be larger than 1. So we get exactly this situation. So if f is a constant, this, div this division algorithm is satisfied in a trivial manner. So suppose then that f of x is a non-constant polynomial, so its degree is something positive. Its degree is not equal to zero. Um, suppose that the degree of g is equal to m, and so therefore we can write our polynomials. f of x is the linear combination of things of the form ai times xi as you go up to n, and then g of x will be the sum of the bj's times xj as you go up to its degree m. And so then in that situation, we why does we, we honestly could assume that with really, with really no consequence whatsoever, we could assume the polynomial f was monic because we could divide by its coefficient. It's not a big deal. Uh, but without having to worry about that, we, we that's the nice thing about a polynomial ring whose coefficients come from a field. Non-zero coefficients can be divided, so we can assume without the loss of generality that f is a monic polynomial. But nonetheless, consider the following polynomial h of x, which is going to equal f of x minus a n over b m times x to the n minus m times g of x. So I want you to notice what's happening right here. Now, I should mention that in this statement, we're using the assumption that the degree of G is actually less than or equal to M, uh, because if that wasn't the case, uh, this could actually be a negative exponent, which wouldn't be a polynomial in that situation. But if the degree of G was actually greater than the degree of F, the, basically the same statement would then apply, that you're going to have F of X equals G, uh, 0 times G of X plus F of X, where F of X has smaller degree. So we, we, when we divide by G, we might as well assume it has a smaller degree. Otherwise, again, 
it's a trivial division statement. So yeah, without the loss of generality, we can assume that g of x has less than or equal to the degree of, of f there. Therefore, this is a monomial that lives inside of our ring. So when you take x to the n minus m and times it by the leading coefficient, x to the m, you'll get x to the n. And then if you take a over b here, um, the b's would cancel. And so notice that when you look at this polynomial right here, its leading term is in fact a to the n times x to the n, which, hey, isn't that the leading term of f of x? They are. So when you subtract these two polynomials, um, you're gonna cancel off the leading term. So the degree of this thing, the degree of h is strictly smaller than the degree of f, which was n in that situation. Now, if we play on induction of the degree of the polynomial f, since we have a degree that's now smaller than n, we could use our, our uh, induction hypothesis where notice, of course, the constant polynomials, the degree is equal to zero. In that situation, that was our base case. So by induction, that is using our inductive hypothesis, since um, since h has degrees smaller than f, we can assume there exists unique polynomials p of x and r of x so that h of x equals p of x times g of x plus r of x, where r of x we can assume is either the zero polynomial or it has a degree uh, that is strictly smaller than m in this situation. And so then if we set q equal to be p of x plus a uh, let me write it over here just so we can see it all in one line. A n over B m times x to the n minus m like so. I'll just erase this so you can see it right here. So q, if q of x is equal to this polynomial right here, then note if we take this q of x and times it by g of x and then add on the remainder r of x, uh, well, q of x by our construction is this polynomial right here. You're going to times it by g, so we distribute g onto these. Uh, so you're going to get p of x times g of x. Then uh, you're likewise going to get uh, this monomial times g of x. I just scooted it over here, uh, moving the r in front. Why did I do that? Well, of course, p of x times g of x plus r of x, that was equal to h of x that we saw earlier. And then this polynomial right here, remember this is what we subtracted from f to construct h. So therefore h plus this polynomial gives back f. All right. And so I do want to emphasize that the reason why it being a field is important, that we can divide by our non-zero coefficients. And so notice what we've now done here is shown that f of x equals q of x times g of x plus r of x. And r of x then satisfies these conditions that it needs to. All right. So we have... Uh, the division algorithm, wait, oh, there's a uniqueness statement built into that. We have to take care of that too. So what if we had two different um, quotients and remainders? So Q1 times G plus R1 is equal to Q2 times G plus R2. These are two distinct divisions here. Well, since they're equal to each other, uh, this is an equation we can manipulate things. That is, we can move the Q2G over here. We can move the R1 over here to get this equation that you see on the screen like so, uh, factoring out the g of x, of course. Now, if these two divisions are in fact distinct from each other, that means that uh, these th this is non-zero over here. Uh, th th these things don't equal to zero uh, because otherwise that would force zero ever wealth. In particular, if the remainders are distinct, then that means this is non-zero. And if the right-hand side is non-zero, since g is non-zero, this product would only be zero if these two things were the same. So if we have a distinct fact, uh, we have a distinct division, uh, these two different divisions, then it's non-zero. But then when you play around with that, well, the degree of the degree of g, it's going to be less than or equal to the degree of g plus some degree of a non-zero polynomial. All right, because uh, that would only make it get bigger or stay the same, I suppose. But as it's an additive function, the degree function, this becomes the degree of g times q1 minus q2 which by the above equation, this is equal to the degree of R1 minus R2, right? Which remember that R1, R1 has a degree smaller than G. R2 has a degree smaller than, than G. So when we add them together, their degree 
is worst case scenario, the size of their larger degrees, both of which are smaller than G. So this, I mean, but it could even be much smaller, right? Maybe they cancel each other out because they're the same degree. So this, ha this has to be smaller than the degree of G, which of course is a contradiction. That shows us that these two, these two uh, divisions are not distinct. Uh, they actually have to be one and the same thing because we were assuming they were distinct to get that contradiction. And therefore, we've proven that in a, in a polynomial ring with field coefficients, you have the division algorithm, aka it is a Euclidean domain. Now, I should mention that on the other hand, if you look at the polynomial ring with two variables, this is in fact not, this is not a Euclidean domain not a Euclidean domain. And basically to see that, you can consider the following situation. If you take F adjoint X, Y, and you mod out by the ideal generated by X and Y, like so, this you can very easily sh show using this first uh, isomorphism theorem for rings, that this is isomorphic to the coefficient field F. Now, since the, um, which of course is not the same thing as this ring right here. So this is a proper ideal. And since the quotient is in fact a field, this shows that the, the ideal generated by X and Y, uh, this is maximal. This is a maximal ideal because the quotient is in fact a field. Okay, so this is a maximal ideal. But it's also true that X does not divide Y. And we also have that Y does not divide X. All right, um, and this can be made by degree considerations, right? X and Y are both to consider degree one polynomials. So they can't divide each other um, because, of how the degree, because of how the degree function behaves, right? It's, it's additive nature there. And so this then gives us that the GCD between X and Y is gonna equal one. If this was a Euclidean domain, then it would have to be a principal ideal domain. And therefore, the ideal generated by x and y would have to equal uh, the principles. The ideal generated by x and y would have to equal the principal ideal generated by their GCD, which would be 1. But the, since 1 is a unit, uh, the ideal generated by 1 is the whole ring. But like I said before, this is a proper ideal, and therefore, you're getting a contradiction. So in particular... Um, in the ring F adjoined X, Y, GCDs are not necessarily linear combinations. Um, and therefore, you, it's not a principal ideal domain. And that, since every Euclidean domain is principal ideal, since it's not a principal ideal domain, it's not even a Euclidean domain. So there are some limitations there. So we saw that if the coefficient field was a, if the coefficient ring was a field, then the polynomial ring would be a uh, Euclidean domain. But when we try to do induction on this thing, so yeah, F is a field, so therefore F adjoint X is a is going to be a Euclidean domain. But then if we throw in one more variable here, this is not a field, this is only a Euclidean domain. So when we start looking at this ring right here, we can't use induction to get that this is also a Euclidean domain. It's not even a, it's not even a PID. We can, in fact, show that it's a domain. That, that we already know. We've proven that. But what we can do is actually show that this is going to be a unique factorization domain. So even though it's the coefficient field, the coefficient ring is a field, we, if we start adding multiple variables, we don't necessarily have a Euclidean domain anymore. But we can produce um, unique factorization domains, and that's something we'll prove in a future lecture.